in Revelation chapter 12 today. The seventh trumpet sounded in chapter 11, announcing the third woe. And these woes were like, woe, it's going to get bad. And the third woe was like, it's going to get real bad. So get ready for this. And uh, this chapter examines the enemy of God and the enemy of all saints. And not only is he the enemy of God and enemy of all saints, he's also the enemy of all humanity. But there are still people that worship him. Many people don't know they are, and there are many people that do know they are because they're not willing to listen to God. And so instead they turn to the enemy. Today's message is titled, The Hungry Dragon. And we continue our study through the book of Revelation with chapter 12 in verse 1, where we read, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So, the first thing we start off with is a sign. A sign tells you that this is not literal. It's a sign. It's an indication of something, but it's not literal. It's not a literal woman that has this unusual appearance. It has to be something else. Roman Catholics believe uh, that verse 1 refers to Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus, who, if that's the case, it won't fit in the rest of the chapter. The context will be completely out. You really have to make something up for that to take place. And that is what happens. You know, the Catholics are told not to read the book of Revelation. They're not supposed to read the last book of the Bible. But if you remember in chapter 1, we're told, if you read it, it's going to bless you. Blessed are those that read it. And so why would we be told not to read it if we're told that we're going to be blessed if we do read it? And so that's why the, the, the way to confuse people is to control them by telling them what something says. And I'm not going to tell you what this says. You're going to hear it from the scripture. I will share with you what other scripture says to confirm what we believe about this scripture. And then it will just all fit. But when you hear the scripture, when you read the scripture, and it doesn't make sense, you go looking at other scripture to find out how to gain clarity about what you're actually reading. So there are others who also believe that this woman is the church. The woman is the church. Why? Why? They believe in replacement theology. They believe that there is no more Jewish nation. The Jewish people have um, been now put in the past. And we are now living in the church age. And the church are now the children of the living God. Well, that's true. We are the children of the living God. But we haven't replaced Israel. They are still the apple of his eye. They're just not living like it. They haven't taken the position. How many Christians are there in the world today that haven't taken the position that God has given them? There are many Christians, there are many churches that don't teach a relationship with Jesus Christ. Having a filling of the Holy Spirit to where we 
uh, can be instruments of God to reach the world around us. But there are many churches that try to speak down to the flock. And, and the flock just hears good messages, nice feel-good things so that you, you, know, you leave the church feeling good about yourself. Quite often, Scripture doesn't allow me to feel good about myself. It allows me to understand the truth about myself. It makes me realize that I don't qualify. That I don't belong in heaven because I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. But that only because of what Jesus Christ has done, I have access to heaven. I can spend eternity with God the Father because of him, not because of me, not because of any good works that I've done. Oh, there are good works, but the good works aren't because I work for my salvation. The good works are because I am saved and they're a result of my salvation, not because I'm trying to earn my salvation or work my way to keep my salvation. There's a big um, discussion on social media about once saved, always saved. There are people that say, no, that's not true. There's no such thing as once saved, always saved. But if there isn't, we're all in trouble. We can lose our salvation at any time. And how would we know? You know, I don't have a certificate on my wall at home that says, saved. You know, Rick Ponzo, saved for eternity, you know, or until he messes up. Right? And, and sometimes that's how people live. They think that they can lose their salvation. You can't lose it. You can walk away from it. But anyone that has truly experienced salvation has a truly experienced a relationship with God, can't walk away from it. Because every step we take walking away, we just feel the pull of the Holy Spirit. Come back. Come back home. Like the prodigal son. Come home. That's where you need to be. That's where we belong. And so, for those that are truly saved... Once saved is always saved because we will always come back to the Lord. And, and that's a good promise for us to trust in. We, we need to believe that. Of course, if, if you're not saved, then you would have a hard time believing that. But for those that are saved, it's something that we cling to because we trust our God. So, those that believe that this is the church, this woman is the church, are those that believe in replacement theology. The church has not replaced Israel, the Jews. We've not replaced the Jews. Romans chapter 11 explains what's going to happen to the nation of the Jews in the future. They're going to be restored. Well, we've also read, even here in Revelation, that there will become a time where the Jews, two-thirds of them will die in Israel because the Antichrist is going to come against them and one-third of them is going to be saved. They're going to escape. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So it was through the woman that God promised to bring a Savior into the world and it was through woman that God told Satan that he would be defeated. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we read, And I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking, this is God talking to Satan. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So we see that her seed speaks of the Messiah that's coming. Her being Israel. He's coming through Israel and he's going to bruise Satan. And Satan will in turn bruise his heel. This prophecy took place 4,000 years later in Bethlehem 
when he was born and then at the cross in Jerusalem when he was crucified. The sign that appears in heaven is a woman clothed with the sun. The woman is representing Israel. Women are often representative of religious systems, sometimes not good ones either. Like Jezebel in chapter 2 was representing a, a, a religious system that was disseminating false teachings. And she was called out. A great harlot in chapter 17 is going to be another religious system, another false religion that's going to be called out. But there's also good women or systems that are called the bride, the bride of Christ. That's us. It's a connotation of a bride, a woman, uh, being married to the bridegroom, Jesus. And so we look forward to that. And uh, that's just another use of that term of the woman. But the woman mentioned here relates to a dream that Joseph had in Genesis chapter 37. Joseph tells his brothers about this dream that he has. And, and this just tells us how um, Joseph should have kept his mouth shut. Here's what he says. He says, so he said to them, please hear this dream that I have dreamed. And there we were, binding sheaves in the field. And then behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed to my sheaf. And his brother said, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? And so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And so his brothers understood what the dream meant. You know, it, it was explained. And they said, oh, are we supposed to bow down to you? And you would think, Maybe Joseph would keep his dreams to himself from then on. But then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed down to me. And so he told it to his father and his brothers. And his fathers rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And so his father got it. He understood what the dream was about. And now looking in chapter 12, verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her, garland, uh, on her head a garland of 12 stars. And it's Jacob, and Rebecca, and the 12 sons who were the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's what this is actually referring to. But people try to take these things out of context. It confuses um, people. So we're in verse 3 now where another character takes the stage. Another sign, a sign not a person, not a thing, a sign, appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. And so here is this picture. It's a dragon. And we're going to hear more about the dragon in upcoming chapters. In the next chapter, there's a dragon, but it's a different dragon. It's portrayed differently, and it gets its power from the first dragon, this dragon. And so what we're seeing is Satan and the Antichrist. We're seeing a picture of Satan's uh, image of himself as God and the Antichrist as Jesus. And we know how that's going to work out. So this sign, as we see, and we're also going to see in verse 9 that it's Satan, but we're not going to get there today. Uh, Satan is not his name. 
Satan is a title. The name Satan means adversary of God. And it's not the opposite of God. He's in opposition to God, but he's not the opposite. Like God is um, able to do everything and anything because he's God. He's omniscient, omnipresent. Uh, Satan doesn't have any of those characteristics. He's not able to do. Satan is limited to one place, to, to one location. He can't be in multiple places at one time. So when you say Satan, you know, made me do it or, you know, really? He's at your house? I'm staying away. It's, he is somewhere in the center of attention, probably in the Middle East. We see what's going on there. I think he's going to have the most impact there. He has his demons there and, and they are doing whatever they're doing, but he doesn't have complete control. He has limited control that has been given to him by God. God allows him some power. And compared to the power that we have, it's minuscule. But the fact is we don't utilize our power to its fullest capability. We have the mind of Christ. We have the power of God. But we have a hard time using it because we're stuck in these dirt clods. I'm not saying you're dirty, but, you know, we were formed out of the dirt. God breathed into us and we came to life, right? And so we're just dirt clods, uh, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And, and that's the reality of, of what we're, we're going to get better bodies. We get 2.0 when we're out of here. Seven heads indicate that he has complete authority complete control. Seven is the number of completion. And so here he has complete control. And that's because God gave him that control, allowed him to have that control. It also implies that he has great intelligence. Now, I don't care how long you've studied the Bible. He knows the Bible better than you do. He knows everything there is. And that's how come there are some things that God hasn't included in the Bible. He left out of the Bible because he doesn't want them to know. And so when we think that we're capable of knowing everything, we're not. Because if we know it, then he knows it. And God doesn't want him to know certain things. Uh, you know, I'm sure Satan is watching TV to find out from the latest televangelist when Jesus is coming back. You know, I, I, you know that, that's kind of silly. Because how is a person, a human, going to know those things, but Satan isn't? You know, so he's just trying to figure it out. He's trying to... Um, uh, be able to get it one step ahead of God, it'll never happen. He can't because he's always subservient to God. Ten horns refers to authorities or powers. So he has these ten horns and they're probably ten countries or groups, organizations uh, of in our world. We're not really sure how that's going to be laid out or broken out. Um, seven continents, and how are that going to fit in? Don't know. But it'll all be worked out when the time comes. And then we read in verse 4, he, His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So, we're reading things that happened thousands of years ago. This isn't sequential. This isn't the tribulation period and we're reading about what's happening sequentially and chronologically in the tribulation period. Because when he took those one-third 
of the angels and were thrown to the earth, um, that happened thousands of years ago. That happened when he was thrown um, to the earth. Now, these are also angels that have access, or demons, I should say, that have access to heaven. Do you know Satan has access to heaven right now? Because he stands before the throne accusing us, making accusations against the saints. He wants to accuse us. He wants, but uh, he, he's not a very good lawyer. He's not going to convince the judge that he's right. And, you know, all we have to say is, oh, Jesus is my lawyer. And, you know, it's, we're done. Uh, we, um, we win in that regard. We won the case. So he was originally a glorious angel of God. He was the anointed cherub that, we're told. He rebelled against God and he brought one third of the angels. You know what's good about that? Two thirds of the angels are still with God. But you know, sometimes people think that angels were created a certain way to obey God, to follow God, to love God, to not, well, this shows that they had free will. They were created beings with free will. And when his pride got to such a point where he decided that he could be God, then everything turned. And he took a third of the... He convinced a third of the angels that he was right. How many people out there in the world today are convinced that what is going on in our world today is right. The things that we're watching happening in the news, uh, the, besides the riots, besides what's going on in our schools, in our courts, all of that stuff, people are thinking that it's right. They're fighting for these things. They're protesting for these things. That don't make any sense at all. Well, it's just like the third of the angels that got thrown from heaven. They were twisted into believing, their minds were twisted into believing that it was the right thing to do. Angels are often referred to as stars of heaven and these fallen angels were thrown to the earth to do the work of the enemy. And there is plenty, of, I don't know how many, we're not given a number. So we don't know how many there are out there. There could be one angel for each of us in the good camp. There could be one angel for each of us in the bad camp that's constantly in your ear telling you things, don't believe that garbage. You know, don't, you know, don't listen to, he's just making that stuff up and... The good news is that we have the truth, it sets us free, and when we have a relationship with the Lord, those voices fall on deaf ears. That's the good news. Satan wanted Jews to be wiped out. He'd been trying this from the very beginning. He was trying to wipe out the Jewish race. How many times have the Jews been under assault by other nations that come along and try to wipe them out? In the book of Ruth, Haman wanted to wipe out all the Jews. He wanted to start with Mordecai. He built the gallows. He was going to kill all... Mordecai? He was beginning with Mordecai, right? Oh, Haman was beginning with Mordecai. I'm just... Huh? Esther. Oh, I said the book of Ruth. This is why I need my wife to correct. <laughs> okay, so the, um, in the book of Esther, I wrote Ruth. Uh, in the book of Esther, um, Morde um, Haman tried to wipe out the Jews, starting with Mordecai. And 
it, it didn't work. He ended up being hung himself from his own gallows. You see, because you try to come against God, it's not going to happen. No matter what it is that you're doing, it may look like you're going to be successful. It's not going to happen. Satan tried every way possible to keep the Messiah from being born. He used demons to populate the earth and then to um, ruin the DNA, to corrupt the DNA on earth. And fortunately, we had Noah, uh, who was pure in his line. And so he was able to carry on the line and the corruption ended with the flood. And then God locked those demons up and they were in the abyss until the time of judgment. Uh, they're going to be let out. That time is going to be coming. So King Saul attempted to kill David. Do you remember when King Saul did? King Saul, he was the good king, right? Well, he started out that way. But he attempted to kill David because if you kill David, you kill the line of David and the Messiah was going to come through the line of David. Once Jesus was born, Satan attempted to kill the Messiah once again when we um, see that, I want to make sure I get his name right, Ruth, no, uh, Herod, <laughs> Herod tried to kill all of the children, well, he did kill all of the children under two, the men under two, male children, um, because he wanted to wipe out the possibility of the Messiah coming. And so this is what we see happening over and over again, the enemy trying to wipe out the Jews. And we see it in the Holocaust and we see it today, where it's still taking place. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. <laughs> Jesus has already, you know, resurrected. He's already gone to sit at the right hand of the Father. So this doesn't, now it just has to do with hating the children of Israel and wanting to destroy them. Verse 5 she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. So Jesus was born, and he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's something that we read in the Old Testament scriptures. And now we're reading it here. We're going to read it again later on at the end of Revelation. He's going to rule with the rod of iron, but that has not happened yet. That's why the, the Jewish leaders, um, the, the, um, the Pharisees and Sadducees, believed that the Messiah was going to come and set up a kingdom and he was going to destroy all the enemies and they were going to be starting the kingdom when he came. The kingdom isn't going to start until later, but they didn't understand that. There was a gap that was going to take place. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm referring to Jesus also that who will rule with a rod of iron. Revelation 19.15 uses that same term as we read about what's going to happen. Satan thought he was winning the battle when Jesus was crucified. He thought, I got him. He's dead. And uh, we, we read the real story in John 10, 14, where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have which are not of this fold them also I must bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd here's the point therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again key thing 
No one takes my life and takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. Satan wasn't taking his life. Satan wasn't crucifying him. He willingly went to the cross. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I've received from the Father. It was a plan from the beginning. You're going to go, you're going to die, and then you are going to come back to life again. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Satan thought he had won when Jesus was crucified. But instead, he is caught up to heaven right now, as we read in verse 5. He was caught up to God and his throne. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. That was the plan of God all along. Verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her 1,260 days. We hear that, that period of time a lot as we're reading um, the book of Revelation in regards to the tribulation period. 1,260 days, three and a half years, 42 months. We'll hear that repeated over and over again. There are two sections that are tied together. The first 42 months and the second 42 months. And so at this time that we're considering these scriptures, we're uh, talking about a mid-trib point, mid-tribulation point, when these things, remember we were talking about um, the, the um, two saints that are going to come down and they're going to preach at the temple. These are witnesses that are going to preach at the temple. And they were there for 42 months, 1260 days at the temple. The time that they're taken up is when the Antichrist then goes into the temple, Matthew chapter 24, declares that he is God, the abomination of desolation. And that starts the second 42 months, the second half of the tribulation period. That is commonly known as the Great Tribulation. So the first half of the tribulation is tribulation. The second half is the great tribulation. It's where the, um, the, the real wrath of God is poured out in the utmost at that point. But as we see this um, 1,260 days, Israel is now going to be, and I believe this is right at mid-trib, when they see this desecration in the temple one-third of them are going to escape. Two-thirds of them are going to be killed there. Those two-thirds that are going to be killed are probably the ones that have taken the mark. Probably the ones that have abandoned the truth and that there is no hope for them. In Zechariah 13, 8, we read, And it came, it shall come to pass, in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. Notice, each one will say that. It's an individual thing. It can't be a group thing. I'm part of the group. No, each person has to choose to say, the Lord is my God. And so one-third of the Jews will be saved. They're going to leave as we see. They're going to flee Israel at that point, And they're going to be going to a place where it was prepared by God that he should feed them there. And many Bible commentators believe we're talking about Petra. We're talking about a place that God has preserved them, 
the Jews in the past in this location called Petra. It's, on, it's in Jordan. It's not too far from Israel. And Petra is a very unique location. It's a canyon, uh, 80 feet high walls. Uh, I think it's even higher than that. And a small opening going into Petra. It's two miles long. It can house all of these one-third of the Jews that are fleeing uh, Israel. And in that place, uh, they can protect it because the narrow opening is easy to defend. But when it comes to defending Israel, they don't need guns. They don't need missiles. They don't even need slingshots. They have God. And God will protect Israel and God will feed and care for Israel during the second uh, three and a half or, or yeah, 42 months or 1260 days. So Hosea speaks of the Jews repenting and returning to the Lord. Hosea 6.1 says, come and let us return to the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Another picture of the restoration of Israel. It's going to happen. Right now, their eyes are blinded, just like many in the world that have no clue as to what's going on. And unfortunately, many in the world are going to enter into the tribulation period uh, without knowing the truth. It's appeared that the Antichrist is having his way on the earth and things are coming to a close very quickly. While we study these events that will happen in the future, we should consider how close we actually are. Not on a timeline, but just knowing the events that have taken, the season that, you know what, we're getting close to summer. How do I know? It's getting warm. Right? So uh, it, it's getting close to summer, and when we're in the midst of summer, we know it. I mean, there's no denying it. We're, we're in, and we're just praying for the fall at that point. This is as hot as it's going to get for Christians. It's going to get a lot hotter for everyone else. They, you think Arizona's bad. And the next event on the calendar is the rapture of the church. Seven-year tribulation will happen shortly after. We know that the hungry dragon is out there. He's hungry. He wants to get as many people to follow him, to be with him forever instead of being with God. And so he's wreaking havoc in the world today, spiritually, economically, socially, physically. He's having his way. We're seeing it across the board. We're seeing hatred. We're, we're seeing physical abuses happening to the, the most sensitive, vulnerable people, our children. And it's happening throughout not only our country, but the world. And when we're seeing these things, we can't imagine that God is smiling on these things. He's not. It, it, it's not the way that he wants things to be but it's because of the degradation of society and because the influence of the enemy on our society that has caused us to reach the place that we're at right now. And that's why I believe we're right at the edge of the moment that he can return. And when that happens, we're going to be okay. But the people that aren't prepared are going to be in trouble. And that's why we're studying this. That's why we're preparing not only ourselves, but 
preparing ourselves to tell people the good news. I mean, not tell them the bad news. Tell them the good news. So here is the enemy. He's the ruler of the kingdoms of the world right now. We read in Revelation 11.15 what happened when the seventh trumpet sounded. Loud voices in heaven were heard announcing, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That happened at the seventh trumpet. That happened before everything that we're reading about right now. The kingdoms of the world have been turned back over to Jesus. And now he's in charge of things. Oh, sure, the enemy's still running amok. But now he's the one in charge. And I'm looking forward to hearing that announcement over the loudspeakers in heaven when I get there. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your word. You continue to reveal glimpses of what will be taking place. But the most important thing is not what will be taking place then on earth, but what will be taking place in heaven as we stand before the throne, as we worship you, as we sing praises to your name as we see you fulfill everything you said you were going to fulfill. And Lord, we pray for those that are here right now that don't know you. I pray that you would open their hearts to hear from you, that your Holy Spirit would minister to them right now. And Lord, I pray that you would become Lord of their lives before you come to take us home. And if not, after. But thank you, Father, because you're preparing us for that day to spend eternity with you. We are grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.